Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. The outdoor board has been ubiquitous around the state of Alabama. Signs are found up and down the interstate, in our towns, on our back roads, and in every imaginable place. One of the most prolific users is Alexander Shinara, whose image can be seen on boards across the state. He's not alone. His many out-of-state competitors can be seen using the outdoor board to advertise their services as they try to keep up with Shinara. Outdoor advertising is not popular with many people, and the state of Alabama has taken it on with Alabama Code Section 23-1-270, also known as the Highway Beautification Act, which sets limits on where these boards can be placed. While some boards may be tacky without much thought put into them, some are pretty creative. For instance, Chick-fil-A has a series of 3D cows hanging from and playfully vandalizing boards asking the viewer to eat more chicken. I've always enjoyed the creativity put into some of these boards. But what makes an outdoor board really stand out are lights. And when I think of lights, I think of Times Square in New York City. But first, a little history before we get to the Great White Way. The original Native American inhabitants of Manhattan Island created the Wequaschek Trail. When the Dutch arrived, they widened the trail, making it the main thoroughfare through the island. The trail was renamed Broadway when the British took over, and this is why Broadway meanders through the city in defiance of the streets around it. As New York grew, a plan was needed for an orderly layout of streets. The New York State Legislature stepped in and appointed a commission. The Commissioner's Plan of 1811 established a layout of grids or gridiron of roads throughout the borough. Broadway was left as is, which created a unique bowtie space at the intersection with 7th Avenue. It's five blocks long between 42nd and 47th Street. Originally known as Longacre Square, it was renamed Times Square in 1904 after the New York Times relocated its office to the newly constructed Times Building. It is now known as One Times Square, and you would know it as the building where the ball drops each New Year's Eve. This urban canyon was a great place to advertise to the thousands of people walking past daily. Theaters, music halls, and upscale hotels moved into the area, and after World War I, Times Square and the advertising boards located there grew dramatically. And some of its more creative and memorable boards would come from the creativity of an Alabama native. Douglas Lee was born in Anniston, Alabama in 1907. He always had a knack for selling things as a youth. He first left Alabama to attend the University of Florida, and to pay his way through college, he sold advertising for the yearbook. He bought all the advertising space in the yearbook for $2,000 on credit, and then resold it for $7,000, making a $5,000 profit. To give you an idea of how much he made, it's over $80,000 today. The allure of doing so well with sales must have been overwhelming. He dropped out of school to work for the General Outdoor Advertising Company. Sources say that he worked in Birmingham, where his parents had moved while he was in college. The 1930 census shows him living in a boarding house in Atlanta. Now, he certainly could have worked in both cities, as General Outdoor had offices across the country. And that is how he got to New York, transferring there in 1931. The Depression was taking its toll on the company, and Lee had his salary cut five times during the short time he had been with the company in New York. When they gave him the sixth cut, he quit and set out on his own. Douglas Lee, Inc. opened its doors on March 4, 1933. A profile of Lee in The New Yorker called him perhaps the only person in the United States besides President Roosevelt who is now in charge of a going business that officially got underway on March 1933. His company was located in the Bronx, but as they say, location is everything. He needed to be closer to the action. Lee offered to design a sign for the St. Moritz Hotel, and instead of asking for cash, which would have been difficult for the St. Moritz at the time, he exchanged his service for the right to live there. This barter allowed him to use the hotel's upscale address at 50 Central Park South for his business. Lee then proceeded to transform the signs at Times Square, and by 1937, his firm was the second largest of its kind in the U.S. 
His first eye-catching creation was in 1933. The billboard featured a coffee mug with real steam coming out of the top. He sold the space to grocery chain A&P to advertise the store's 8 o'clock coffee. He seemed to have found his niche with this sign. Big, bright, bold, and creative enough to stand out from the competition all around him, even himself. He dubbed this new type of sign spectacular. It started a new era of signage in Times Square. One of Lee's most iconic signs was for Camel Cigarettes. Artcraft Strauss was a leading sign company in Times Square, and they anticipated the onset of World War II. And they knew that the lights would have to go out during wartime or Times Square and the city would become an easy target for enemy bombers. They were looking for ways to attract attention without the neon and light bulbs. Lee's solution was to feature Camel Man, and the sign was installed on the Claridge Hotel's facade in 1941. Every four seconds from 7 a.m. to 1 a.m., a perfect O of smoke would be exhaled from Camel Man's mouth using steam from the hotel heating system. Over the next 25 years, the image of Camel Man would change until the sign came down in 1966. Interestingly, two years before the sign came down, Lee purchased the Claridge Hotel in hopes of repurposing it for commercial and retail space. Bond Close took over a two-story building between 44th and 45th Street. Lee convinced the owners to build an enormous sign 90 feet high in the length of the entire building. He created a waterfall in the sign that used 10,000 gallons of circulating water pumped over the falls every minute by 23 gigantic pumps on the roof. The waterfall was 27 feet high and 132 feet long and was flanked by two 50-foot tall figures. They seemed naked during the day, but were clothed in lights at night. In 1954, after just six years, Lee made a proposition to Bond Close to allow other companies to use the sign space. They agreed, and Pepsi-Cola took it over. The two human figures became Pepsi-Cola bottles, and the clock was replaced with a giant bottle cap with the Pepsi logo on it. And of course, the waterfall stayed. During Douglas Lee's long career, he designed around 78 spectaculars. Some of his more notable signs include a sign for Ballantine beer that featured a giant clown peaching quoits onto a peg. The quoit, or ring, was in the shape of Ballantine's three-ring logo. Wilson Whiskey's sign was 4,000 feet of display space, 100 miles of wire, and 10,000 light bulbs. Cool Cigarettes featured a winking penguin that stood on a mound of ice. There was an animated cartoon for old gold cigarettes that had 4,100 bulbs. Bromo Seltzer had actual effervescent action, better known to us as bubbles. And in keeping with the bubble theme, Super Suds Detergent had floating soap bubbles. There was a 40-foot high beer bottle and goblet which was filled from a tap. At the Low Mayfair building on 47th and 48th, Lee created a sign for Schaefer beer. He used the corner of the building in his design, and two 55-foot glasses touched in a toast at the corner of the building. He even ventured outside of Times Square. A Coca-Cola sign on Columbus Circle gave an ever-changing weather forecast featuring a house and pictures of the sun, rain, snow, etc. The featured slogan was, Thirst Knows No Season. And Lee went above and beyond the call of duty. When one woman kept hanging her laundry in front of one of his signs, he paid for her weekly laundry bills to keep her from doing it. He had a dream to turn the Empire State Building into a giant cigarette ad for Lucky Strike. He proposed that the very top mooring mast would be the glowing end of the cigarette with smoke rising into the heavens. This ultimate spectacular almost happened when at the last minute, building owners came to their senses and decided against it. He did get his chance to work on the Empire State Building. In 1976, he designed the wildly popular red, white, and blue lighting for the country's bicentennial. He designed lights for the tops of New York skyscrapers such as Citicorp, the Helmsley and Crown Buildings, and the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. After World War II, Lee leased surplus blimps from the Navy. He painted the blimps for daytime viewing and installed lights for nighttime viewing. He used the blimps to advertise for clients such as Ford, Wonder Bread, Mobile Gas, and MGM, which promoted its upcoming feature, National Velvet. Remember the Times Building, which eventually became one Times Square? 
Lee bought it in the 1960s, stripped the marble from the building, and turned it into a showcase for signs, which is what it is today. In 1984, Lee designed and illuminated a large 17-foot by 14-foot snowflake with 3,000 lights and over 12,000 crystals. This snowflake hung over the intersection of 5th Avenue and 57th Street every holiday season, starting in 1984. It has since been replaced with a newer snowflake, this one designed by Baccarat and is now known as the UNICEF Crystal Snowflake. Douglas Lee died at the age of 92 in a Manhattan hospital. The next time you're in Times Square, look around and remember that a son of Anniston, Alabama had a vision for Times Square that gave New York its visual identity to this day. I am proud to announce that the book Alabama Short Stories Volume 1 is now available at Amazon.com. It features the first three season stories of the podcast in book form. It's a perfect gift for that friend or family member who just doesn't want to listen to a podcast. It's also great for podcast fans who want pictures with their stories. And it's a perfect gift for that hard to buy person in your life. You know who they are. Now get them the book. It's available as paperback, hardback, or Kindle version. Not only will it make your life better, but it will help us to continue to produce this podcast. It's a win-win. You can find a link at alabamashortstories.com or search Alabama Short Stories on Amazon.com. Order yours today.